Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to encourage and develop skills in computer programming. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. We are working with public sector partners and industry representatives to address skills issues in Scotland's digital sector with a programme of work built around the recommendations in 2014's Digital Skills Investment Plan. Examples of the collaborative work include the recent opening of Code Clan, an industry-led digital skills academy designed to help meet the immediate digital skills needs faced by Scottish businesses. We've also funded the Digital World Marketing Campaign, aimed at young people, and women in particular, uh, to raise awareness about the careers and opportunities that digital skills and qualifications can create. Will the coffee. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, she will be aware that across Europe it's estimated that 100 million citizens have insufficient digital skills and are excluded from the digital society. Could I ask what the Scottish Government and Scotland's colleges in particular are doing to help support the development of vital computing skills in this industry? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is a great deal of work going on, and I've, obviously I've mentioned some of that in, the, uh, in my opening response. Um, the colleges have long acknowledged the importance of responding uh, to the need for STEM courses, including computing skills. And, and as a primary provider of these, colleges do have a significant role to play in ensuring these courses are prioritised. Uh, in its guidance to the sector, the Scottish Funding Council has recommended that colleges use the information from skills investment plans and regional skills assessments and to engage with local employers to assess which courses are required to meet regional need. Just yesterday, I know my colleague Angela Constance visited Dundee and Angus College's Code Academy, which provides a good opportunity to show all of the young people and children involved with it the huge variety of jobs available in our technologies industries. But that is just one example of work being done in the colleges. Question two, Jean Arcourt. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action that it is taking to take forward the proposals of the Commission on local tax reform. Minister Marco Biaggi. The First Minister established the Commission on Local Tax Reform jointly with COSLA to examine options for the future of local taxation. Before the end of the current parliamentary term, the Scottish Government will bring forward plans for reform of local tax, which will reflect the principles of the Commission's report. Jean Arker. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, can he at least declare today that this will be the last year of the unfair and regressive council tax? Minister. The Scottish Government is very proud of the effect that the council tax freeze has had in uh, mitigating the unfairness of the council tax. It's noticeable that a commission that had representatives from the SNP, <laughs> Labour, Lib Dems and Greens, not a group which easily find agreement, declared that the council tax was an unfair tax and that it hits those on low incomes the most. So I would express some caution to anybody who calls for a rapid end to the council tax freeze or the use of council tax when it has been uh, observed by all of these people to be an unfair way of raising revenue. Question number three, Paul Martin. To ask the Scottish Government what steps have been taken to improve health in the East End of Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Improving the nation's health is a priority and we are committed to prioritising our health service and making sure it is fit for purpose. We have already substantially increased funding for all boards with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's budget increasing by 21.3 per cent since 2007. That will give the, the board a record budget of £2 billion and £78.9 million in 2016-17. That is an increase of £96.3 million compared to 15-16. We also need to uh, up the pace on transferring services to the community as we push forward the integration of health and social care. And that's why, of course, we're investing some 250 million in this area in next year's budget, of which Glasgow will receive their proportionate share. Paul Martin. Officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the crucial role that Lightburn Hospital plays uh, in improving health in the east end of Glasgow. And she will be aware of the concerns of the local community that it's been earmarked for closure by NHS Greater Glasgow. Can the Minister assure me that beyond the next 10 years, uh, Lightburn Hospital will have a future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, um, as I made clear to Paul Martin at Health Questions last week, um, absolutely none of the suggestions in what is a, a draft discussion paper have been formally put forward for consideration. And I think the, the Chair of the Health Board made that very clear 
in his comments. Now, you know, the member will be aware uh, when Nicola Sturgeon, as the previous Cabinet Secretary, um, previously rejected proposals to close Lightburn Hospital in 2011, and she did so because she had repeatedly heard, not least from local patients and clinicians, that the hospital provided high-quality services that were greatly valued by what is a significantly disadvantaged uh, community. I would have to be convinced by any formal proposals, which haven't come, but any form of proposals uh, to close Lightburn Hospital, that this position had materially changed and that what would replace it would have to be able to be demonstrated would provide a better service. But as I've made clear, <coughs> nothing has come to me and this is a, a draft paper that the board have not um, accepted yet in any way um, as, as uh, concrete proposals for even the board to take forward. Question number four, Rob Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much surface water plantation forestry absorbs from surrounding water courses and rainfall in the Highlands per annum. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, we know that well designed forests can play an important role in water management, including in some circumstances improving flood mitigation. The 2011 National Forest Inventory identified a total of 203,281 hectares of plantation forestry mainly comprising established conifer forests in the Highland Local Authority region. Information published by Forest Research shows that each hectare of matured conifer plantation forest in the Highlands has a capacity to absorb approximately 7,000 cubic metres of rainfall. And this means that the plantation forests in the Highlands will have an annual absorption rate of approximately 1.4 billion cubic metres of water. Rob Gibson. I thank uh, the Minister for that answer. And obviously, in addition to absorbing water, uh, what amount of CO2 is sequestered by plantation forestry in the Highlands per annum? And will this lead to a survey of uh, plantable land in our uplands? Minister. Well, the official statistics show that in 2013, uh, forestry sequestered 10 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in Scotland. And based on the calculations for an average conifer forest, it is estimated that the same area of plantation forestry in the Highlands sequesters approximately uh, 2.13 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents per year, each year. Claudia Bumish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, could I ask the Minister uh, if she's able to give an update on agroforestry and the contribution to flood prevention that this can make, as, as well as um, agroforestry as an appropriate uh, contribution to addressing climate change challenges. Minister? I'm very happy. I don't have the detail uh, with me at the moment um, to answer the, the member's question, but I'm very happy uh, to supply that information to the member uh, in writing afterwards. David McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> forestry as an industry is becoming increasingly important, especially as a tool against the, in, as the fight against climate change. So what efforts are the Scottish Government specifically doing with an aim to encourage forest plantation and replantation for CO2 mitigation purposes? And how will they deal with the predicted hole in, in uh, forestry production um, in, in about 20 years' time? Minister? Well, to answer some of the, the members' questions, I mean, the Scottish Government does also, we do fund and support research into the use of our woodland creation as a means to also, in addition to mitigating the climate change, but to reducing uh, our flooding. And that research includes modelling our catchment, our economic and mapping studies designed to quantify uh, and demonstrate how our forests can also help us to contribute to our flood risk management. And research is actually being trialled at the moment in a number uh, of locations and outputs from the trials will be disseminated to, to the industry. But obviously, as the member shows, the Scottish forestry sector is growing, is contributing nearly a billion pounds gross value added to Scotland's economy every year with over 25,000 full-time equivalents people uh, now working uh, in the sector. But in 2013, forestry was the only sector in which there has been a, a net emissions sink. Question number five, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed social care with the City of Edinburgh Council. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Scottish Government officials are in regular contact with the City of Edinburgh Council in relation to social care. Sarah Boyer. 
Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that people are dying waiting for care, that there's a high turnover in care staff, that there's an unreliable and poor quality of services being provided, and that there's a lack of training with the care staff who have to provide a range of needs, whether it's from autism to dementia? And what share will the Council receive of the allocation that she has made of £250 million for extra care services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I... Uh I certainly deeply regret anyone having to wait longer than necessary to receive their care package and we will continue to work with all councils including Edinburgh to improve uh, provision. Just, just to set out um, some of the, the work that has been done with, with Edinburgh, the City of Edinburgh um, has been allocated an additional £8.19 million from the Integrated Care Fund for 2015-16 and over 2.4 million additional investment to help reduce delayed discharge from hospital this year. Uh, as Sarah Boyat will be aware, um, they will of course receive their share of the 250 million additional funding announced by John Swinney in his draft budget. Um, and that will be laid out once a, 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 um, agreement has um, been reached. But in addition to all of that, I can tell Sarah Boyack that we have offered the City of Edinburgh Council an additional support of £2 million in return for improvements to social care in Edinburgh. I'm very clear that improvements need to be made. Um, and of course, there have been a number of senior personnel changes that I think will help to deliver the, those improvements. So I think uh, as a government, we have been supporting the, the City of Edinburgh Council to make the improvements they need to make and indeed have given them additional resources to help them do that. Malcolm Chisholm. Does the Cabinet Secretary know how much uh, NHS Lothian is proposing to contribute to the integrated joint board with the City of Edinburgh Council and in fact the same would apply to other health boards across Scotland and if she doesn't how does she know that the 250 million or Edinburgh share of that will be additional or simply netted off what uh, NHS Lothian is planning to give to the integrated joint board? Mm -hmm. Well, let me be very clear on the first point. All of the £250 million will be routed um, through NHS boards to the integrated partnership. So all of the £250 million will be routed through. Now, in terms of the breakdown of that £250 million and what that delivers, that is subject to detailed negotiations and discussions with COSLA uh, at the moment, and those will reach a conclusion. But I'm very clear that we want to make sure that as much of that resource as possible delivers on the priorities we all want to see in terms of additional capacity, making the improvements in the sector that all of us agree need to be made. And I would hope Malcolm Chisholm would support us in those efforts. Question number six, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve prisoners' access to education. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Scottish Prison Service has established a multi-agency steering group with representation from Education Scotland, Scotland's Colleges, Creative Scotland and the Scottish Qualification Authority to help inform the core specification for a proposed new generation learning and skills contract. The core intentions of the new contract are to provide a more creative curriculum and expansion of higher and distance learning opportunities to improve access and stimulate interest in learning, improve screening processes to detect literacy and numeracy problems and potential learning difficulties are core features of our new approach to promoting better access and levels of engagement. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, I've been made aware that uh, Her Majesty's Prison in Greenock has got a notable record in this field, and many of the things that you, you've mentioned there just now may well be taking place there. But can you assure me that the Chamber will be looking at the, what they're doing uh, and if there are any plans to replicate this success across the rest of the prison service? Cabinet Secretary. Epstein Officer, uh, HMP Greenock does indeed have a good record in improving access to education for prisoners, as do a number of other establishments within the Scottish Prison Estate. Uh, initiatives which are based around the visual and expressive arts have proved extremely successful in helping to stimulate engagement within education across the prison estate, uh, with HMP uh, Shots receiving more accolades than any other UK prison at the recent UK uh, Coastal Awards. Uh, but I can also inform the member that there has been significant international interest 
in the model which has been taken forward by the Scottish Prison Service in the delivery of education within our prisons. And the Scottish Prison Service are continuing to work with all of their establishments and our education providers to make sure that best practice is captured and shared right across the prison estate. Alice McInnes. Thank you very much. Um, Cabinet Secretary, currently the education services are provided on a national contract. Um, do you consider that there would be some benefit at this stage in pausing and considering whether regional contracts would um, be an improvement and uh, allow a continuation of a, um, a better transition from prison to community if local uh, colleges were involved? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the way in which the education contract is provided just now is to, to uh, further education uh, colleges uh, which provide services right across the prison estate. Uh, that contract was extended until uh, next year in order to undertake the work which I've set out in looking at developing a new generation uh, contract for the delivery of education provision within our prison estate that will allow us to look at how we can continue to build on the good progress that's been delivered and, of course, to make sure that we're looking at opportunities to build links between prisons and establishments locally to them in order to continue education from prison back into the community. Question number seven, John Mason. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had regarding the homeless hostel, the Belgrove Hotel. Minister, Margaret Burgess. Homelessness services are the responsibility of local authorities and addressing the needs of the residents of the Belgrove Hotel is a matter for Glasgow City Council. The Cabinet Secretary for Community, Social Justice and Pensioners' Rights and I have both met with the leadership of Glasgow City Council to discuss the issue of the Belgrove Hotel and we have also corresponded with them on this subject. The Cabinet Secretary last met the then leader, Councillor Matheson, to discuss this in the summer. Officials have continued to engage with the Council on the Scottish Government's behalf. Discussions have focused particularly on strategically reviewing Glasgow's homelessness services. The best interests of the Belgrove's residents can only be met as part of a wider approach that helps to address issues such as rough sleeping and the provision of homelessness services with those, for those with more complex needs in Glasgow. Joe Mason. I thank the Minister for the answer, and I do welcome any increased provision uh, for homeless people. But I wonder if the Minister does not consider that we do need some more regulation in this area. After all, people in housing associations are regulated, people in care homes are regulated, but people who need both housing and care in the Belgrove Hotel are not regulated. Minister. I appreciate this is an issue that the Member has raised on more than one occasion you know, in this chamber. Um, and it has in the past. We've looked at whether um, the Belgrove Hotel should come under the Care Inspectorate, and that was clearly uh, not, not the position. The Care Inspectorate didn't think that was the position. The Belgrove Hotel is not a typical homelessness accommodation in Scotland. In fact, it's the only one of its kind, and it involves complex issues that I don't think can be solved by more regulation. It is licensed as a house of multiple occupation and Glasgow City Council has used the HMO licensing framework to require improvements in the condition of the hotel. But ultimately, and I know uh, John Mason's um, concern is about the well-being of the residents of the Belgrove Hotel and their needs and wishes. And these issues require a focus on prevention and providing appropriate services for the residents. And we'll continue to work with Glasgow City Council around their review of homelessness services to improve options and outcomes for those who are currently using the Belgrove Hotel. Question number eight, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recommendations of the Wildlife Crime Penalties Review Group. Minister Ailey MacLeod. I very much uh, welcome the report from the Wildlife Crime Penalties Review Group that was chaired by Professor Mac Pusty. I have been considering the 10 recommendations in the report with colleagues from Justice and other relevant areas. I have already written to Professor Pusty to thank him and the group for the diligence in producing such a thoughtful and very helpful report and will be writing to him again shortly with the formal Scottish Government's response uh, to the report's recommendations. I will also send a copy of that response to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee and will be published on the Scottish Government uh, web pages. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, this week I visited a site where badger sets under current use have been illegally disturbed by developers. What steps will the Minister take to ensure that developers receive appropriate guidance so that ignorance can't be used as an excuse in cases of wanton destruction? And how will the Government's response to the Wildlife Crime Penalties Report 
help to protect badgers, to enforce adherence to wildlife-related planning guidance, and to ensure that appropriate sentences are delivered in cases such as this. Minister. Well, of course, the Scottish Government will be actively considering what further work will have to be undertaken before formal steps are taken to implement uh, any of the recommendations in the Pussy Report. And should there be a requirement to consult, then that will be, that will be done. But in terms of the detailed questions that the Member has asked, I'm more than happy to write to her in private. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery Mr Asad Kesar, MPA, the Speaker of the Pakistani Provincial Assembly of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one.